Good evening, and welcome to this year's very first Hilltop Show appearance. Uh, tonight, I'm pleased to have with me two very special guests, my fellow Southerner and GASA presidential candidate, Mr. Spencer Woodall. Welcome. Pleasure. And uh, his running mate and GASA vice presidential candidate, Anya Kariani who is also the president of Prospect Records. Thank Thanks. you so much for coming. Thanks for having Thanks us. Thanks for having us, man. My name is Spencer Woodall. I'm a junior in the MSV studying business and global affairs from Union, South Carolina. And my name is Anya Cariani, and I'm also a junior in the SFS studying STIA from Long Island, New York. Uh, which state makes the best pimento cheese? <laughs> You know, you're, the pimento cheese you got me was really good. I really enjoyed that. Well, now, that was made in North Carolina. I hope you know that. I mean, yeah, but, hey, I have this place in Charleston that my mom really likes to go to. It's some of the best pimento cheese you'll ever have. Now, you try it. So, so is palmetto good? Is is that the best you can get at the store? Palmetto pimento cheese? Yeah, like the one from, uh, what's it called, Polly's Island. Yeah, the Polly's Island cheese is real good. My parents try to get the white Polly's Island cheese. The palmetto cheese, it's so good. Every time we go to Charleston, we go to the shop, this little butcher, and we, we fill up on our cheese. So, so awesome. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, I also wanted to ask you, uh, so a lot of people in your beautiful home state uh, get gold barbecue and good barbecue mixed up. Mm -hmm. um, but you said that in your part of the state, in right. upstate South Carolina, right. uh, they, they actually like our, our western North Carolina style better. Mm -hmm. Is that true? So what's your take on that? Because that's going to be a key issue for the swing voters in this election. <laughs> <laughs> a lot, yeah, a lot of barbecue experts out there. Well, um, so in the lower state, we have the vinegar-based barbecue, and that's actually what my uh, relatives use. They own a little barbecue stand where they make barbecue every Memorial Day. And I think Fourth of July, they use like a vinegar base. But there's this really good barbecue place in... Uh, in my town called Midway Barbecue has the best red sauce you'll ever have. It's so good. I'll and you can't have mustard based. I'll, I'll have to try it. But if there's any issue that we disagree on, I'll attribute it to the uh, the mustard based barbecue sauce Absolutely. down in, in South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> Something in the mustard. Yeah. So, uh, Anya, I wanted to ask you, uh, so I'm a big vinyl fan. Okay. So, uh, when you get to Gussa, are you going to lead a vinyl resurgence across campus? You know what, I'll try my best, but I think uh, Copley can only take so many record players blaring at once, so <laughs> for, the, for the good of society, I think uh, we'll, push, we'll push the AirPod campaign, you know? So now I, I want to dive into some more serious issues for the folks at home. Barbecue so, is a serious issue. I, I know, but there are even more pressing ones, and you're going to find out what those are in <laughs> just a minute. So, Spencer, uh, we've talked about how you're a libertarian, and as you know, uh, one of the main priorities for the Libertarian Party mm -hmm. in the United States is defending every American's constitutional right to operate a toaster without a license, <laughs> right? Absolutely, now, yeah. <laughs> now, you know, pe people did laugh about this, but this is, a, this is a serious issue at Georgetown because the policy, if you discover a toaster as an RA, it is actually to call the GUPD. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> that's, that's, that's serious. So will you commit to protect our constitutional rights to operate a toaster without a license? Let's be clear. Your right to have a toaster without a license is going to be protected under our administration. Period. <laughs> so the Second Amendment is uh, very important to libertarians, and um, uh, I've learned that having a kitchen knife uh, counts as possessing a prohibited lethal weapon. Mm -hmm. uh, so will will you also commit to protecting? Our, uh, our right to own knives for the sole purpose of chopping vegetables? Of course. Yeah, Spencer's a big vegetable eater, so... <laughs> totally, yeah. yeah that you know, one salad I have a week really, really does the job. That's, <laughs> that's uh, you know, really deeply ingrained in Southern culture is mm -hmm. eating, eating healthily. <laughs> that's, yeah. Speaking of North Carolina, I would say that, uh, you know, 
people have told me that I might have been a Jeopardy contestant in my past life, but I actually happen to know the motto of North Carolina is Essay Quam Videri. That's right. Correct? To, to be rather than to, to seem. To be rather than to seem. And that is one of the pinnacles of our campaign. We we are here as, as vessels for our students. We are just here to represent student interests. Um, that's something that is so important to us is to not play the power of politics. Mm -hmm. um, we're simply here to achieve results and be transparent while doing it. I agree with Anya's point, even though she... Uh, learn the uh, the <laughs> motto of the inferior Carolina. Hey, be <laughs> careful. <laughs> you know, it's a nice that's a nice try. I appreciate that. But I definitely we definitely share the same sentiment. We need to make an administration that's more transparent and more helpful for students that reaches outside of the box away from ideas that anybody else has ever had. And that's what we're going to be good for. So, you know, this this interview is going to be a journey of exploration. Um for me, because I know uh, I know y'all two are running. I know uh, Cameron and Alyssa have declared, but other than knowing who the candidates are, uh, I don't really know that much about what's going on or what uh, Gussa has accomplished. Like for uh, those of us who don't have two hours every week to go to the Senate meeting, mm -hmm. it's it's difficult to know. Uh, about some of the good work that y'all are doing and what you're accomplishing this year. So could either one of the two of y'all uh, give us sort of a roadmap of what has happened since that contentious election last year and where you hope to go from here? Um, so as Augusta Outsider, um, one of the reasons I joined this campaign was because I was seeing so many, and my friend Spencer is very active on Gusta, so I was hearing so many bills that were being proposed and brought to the table and discussed with the administration, and so little was actually being done, um, which I know, Spencer, you can probably eliminate more from the Gusta side, but that's what inspired me to join the campaign, and I have never been associated with Gusta. I don't know that much of what happens interpersonally within Gusta, but um, if, I were, if I am elected, I pledge to actually make actionable change happen. Um, instead of focusing on extreme initiatives with little chance of passing, so. And and could y'all elaborate for us, and maybe Spencer can can do this? Uh, what are some of those bills that didn't get done, and and perhaps more importantly for folks, including me, that have lost a lot of faith in Gusa, is uh, what ha what has gotten done this year. I think the biggest reason why people lose uh, faith in GUSA is not really because of what bills we pass. It's because a lot of the student leadership tries to pass bills that don't really even matter. I know you read the Washington to Washingtonian article where they were yes. trying to say, we stand for the sex workers, you know what I mean? I don't know how many Georgetown students are sex workers, but I can guarantee you that that's not actually doing any kind of change. I don't know um, either. I probably couldn't afford any of them. <laughs> <laughs> and on bouncing off of that, what we would focus on in our platform, instead of um, such broad strokes, we would, mm -hmm. for example, contribute more funds to um, affinity groups, uh, which mm -hmm. focus on supporting people like sex workers within our community, um, who can actually support them on the day to day and help them help them throughout their lives. Our budget plan, we have. We have a lot of cuts. I know you talked about me being a libertarian. So, you know, one of the things about that is we believe in spending responsibly. And right now, I've, I'm looking at these executive budgets that the current administration has, and there's so much material where we could give money to other groups that really need it. I actually talked to a board member of the Student Advocacy Office today. They said that GUSA does not do a very good job of giving them the money they need. So one of the things I'm working on is trying to give them as much money as they can. So There's, there's your toaster issue. <laughs> so, so this is something, and, and this, this actually was not something I had necessarily uh, planned on talking about because I didn't know enough to ask about it. Mm -hmm. But I, I've heard a lot of GUSA people refer to budget cuts in abstract terms. And when people refer to them in abstract terms, you know, it sounds like they're taking away resources from people that need them. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering uh, wh what wasteful spending is going on that we can cut down on, and then where do you plan to, uh, you said you want to reallocate mm -hmm. to certain things. So can you explain that a little further? Yeah, so I... 
this is very detailed. I know a lot of viewers might not appreciate. No, we want to hear the details. <laughs> I'm I'm along. Yeah. So please please give us some details because I think for people to have faith in Gusa, it's important that mm -hmm. they know the details of what y'all are doing. Right. So every semester we have about ten thousand dollars, twenty thousand dollars annually. Right now we spend four hundred dollars on something called the executive officer, and basically what they do is they take meet take notes from our meetings and give them to the executive, and they take attendance and they take vote tallies. Now one of the things I was thinking is that's a completely useless position. I love Phoebe if you're watching. I love the I love you, but. We don't need an executive officer. I could easily have one of my chief of staff or my vice president tally the votes. There's no, like, we're the transparent ticket. Like, we can, we know what we're doing. We There's not going to be any red tape as far as that's concerned. We can cut that. We don't need that money to go there. And we were going to put that $400 into the student advocacy budget. Also, last year they had about $10,000 that they had not spent. And a lot of it went to the executive discretionary budget and the Senate discretionary budget, where one of the things we spent that on was Microsoft Teams. We don't need Microsoft Teams. We have email, we have text message, we have group meet. Like We're spending money on things we don't need to be spending things on. So there's a lot of material that we can cut. And as soon as I'm in office, I'm going to look at every little corner we can cut and put it back into the community. So to be clear, uh, when you talk about budget cuts, you're referring to the cutting the internal budget of GUSA, not right. the budget of other clubs on campus. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Like, again, I believe that the best way we can have a good community on campus is through the clubs, yes. prospect um, records. And yeah. I'm the president of a club. Um, we're under the um, SAC and media board. So um, we have to, had to fought, fight tooth and nail for every dollar that we've received. And we do things like put on large-scale concerts and create and foster artists um, on campus and release their music on professional streaming platforms and we've launched like careers I don't know if you know the band back to yours um, they're a pretty famous Georgetown band um, Prospect Records helped um, help them launch and now they're touring um, so without without clubs like ours uh, that just wouldn't be available um, so I think pouring this the um, the external budgets which are like superfluous, I think, um, back into our students and the heart of our students, really, I think is um, one of our more admirable initiatives. As far as our um, exact plans, I have we have worked out a budget where we have about $1,000 left over for the semester. I like a budget surplus, that's <laughs> right. We're trying to figure out how to mix that in. Uh, one of the ideas we suggested was putting that into clubs, but just in case that's not a suitable amount of money because a thousand dollars you know can can be very little especially with you know how high inflation is as our tuition <laughs> increased by a lot so one of the things we're thinking about doing is also perhaps putting time and resources into mental health campaigns like events so that students mental health are taken care of Th that's very important and you know um, I, I'm someone who has has dealt with mental health issues in the past and so you know one one issue that is important to me is to make sure that uh, people you know after that initial consult with caps mm -hmm. that people have resources available to them to maintain that steady um, that steady care right so do y'all do have any ideas about how to strengthen CAPS? I mean, one of the, uh, one of the, um, one of the main issues I would say with CAPS, sorry, one of the main issues I would say with CAPS is just the lack of personnel. And because the personnel are required to be licensed mental health professionals, the only way to remedy that is through um, increased budget. So mm -hmm. even $1,000 could go a long way. Um, providing resources to, um, to to kids that are not being followed up with and even providing initiatives like small mental health um, mental health activities throughout the day or um, events that we as as Gusa could put on um, to foster better mental health um, so maybe in the form of study breaks or things like that um, 
I know I was part of an organization that did like goat yoga, which was, <laughs> sounds sounds ridiculous, but you know it boosts yeah. morale. And yeah, I actually saw a post the other day that called uh, the Caps budget a bag of Cheetos and five loose singles. So you know, <laughs> it, there's only up from here. Yeah. And also, Carlton, um, I've taken a few classes this semester where professors have actually implemented a pre-meditation before class. Like, we sit for about a minute. Yes. Do a deep breath. Have you been in uh, some of those classes? I, I did one last semester, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it was about theology. And, yes. and so yeah. the professor felt that we needed to put into practice mm -hmm. uh, what we were learning about. And I found it to be very helpful. Mindfulness and meditation, I'm a big fan, and we all need to be doing more of it. Yeah. So, uh, I'm sorry, I, I interrupted. Were you going to say? You're good. I'm, maybe we even have the same theology professor. Uh, professor Cho? Yes, thank that's you. exactly right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, five, like about three minutes before class, do a nice deep breathing exercise. I even showed it to my roommate once, and he, he really calmed down. And... I don't know if like a lot of professors would be down for this idea, but Georgetown, let's face it, is a pressure cooker. Like we're in a very stressful environment in the middle of Washington D.C. We have a lot of stress about what we're going to do for our careers, as you can imagine. Any kind of break we can get, like whatever Gusa could do, maybe it's have an event where we could, you know, promote meditation and mental health awareness. Anything that we can do, if we can even. If we can make CAPS appointment wait time a day shorter in my administration, that's, that that's will be a big deal. That will be a big deal, exactly. A BFD, as the president says. Right. <laughs> I will work so much just to get that fixed because I know what people go through. I've had friends that have struggled with this, and we need to do something about it. That's, and that's and, right. And also, um, I had a plan about, I know uh, food insecurity is a very big problem for students. One of the ideas I think that we could implement within a week of our administration is we have a peer meal exchange service. So you remember how when we were going into college for the first time, we had, you know, juniors, like I was an MSP kid. We had juniors who would basically tell us about their college experience and what to look forward to. Did you have anything like that? Did you? Uh, not really. NSO of sorts? Yeah, I mean, uh, not really NSO, but like a peer advisor. But basically what I'm thinking no, is... Not really beca because of how the pandemic was at the time. Right. Yeah. But uh, go, go on. Yeah, so basically, I know when I had a peer advisor who was like a junior in the MSP, he would tell us, he would give me advice whether to take a placement test, which accounting professors take. That was really important. And I know for a fact that those juniors and seniors are the ones who really struggle with food insecurity because they're li usually living off campus. That's right, they've got more bills to pay. That's absolutely right. And all the freshmen pretty much have unlimited meal plans. So I figure if we could create a system where freshmen could volunteer to give meal swipes to juniors, seniors, anyone with food insecurity that would really need it, then we could do that. We could implement that in a week. And that's how we could really do measures to food insecurity on campus. Excellent. So what is... Uh, what is a marginalized community that you feel like you have represented well, and what's one that you would like to represent better? This is a question that I would, uh, ideally, both of you would answer, but at least one of you. Um, as a member of the LGBT community myself, um, I mean, I represent it in my daily life. Um, Which letter? Do you mind me asking? Uh, the B. Okay, great. Yes. Me too. Me too. Congratulations. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so <laughs> I, as someone, as a member of this community, I was personally very disheartened because I, I walk around campus every day and I interact with people and and I see so many rainbow flags everywhere and I talk to people and have conversations and then something like the Pence, Pence event happens and there's people s like screaming slurs outside the event and I'm just... Mm -hmm. And I I know a lot of my friends who were there um, were 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 scared for their life and scared that they were yeah. going to be persecuted because of that. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's it's still something very scary on campus. And I think supporting LGBT groups on campus is is extremely important because even though it seems that you know it's more it's more uh, we've made some progress since since however many years ago. I think there's still so much progress to be made in terms of equality. So, so that that's a group that you feel you've represented well yeah. and and. What's one that you'd like to learn more about or, or do more to help? Um, so I personally am not a person of color. Um, so I think 
living, uh, hearing the experiences of people on color on this camp, of color, oh, sorry, uh, people of color on this campus is something that I would really like to, to uh, do if I were to be elected. And I think hearing voices of color, um, I think is, is paramount um, to making equitable change on campus. And, and is, there, is there any specific voice that you'd like to hear? Um, I think I had, I had some, I had a very close friend who was part of the Vietnamese Student Association and she was detailing to me some, um, some things that were not so pleasant that she's experienced in her time mm -hmm. here. So I think, mm -hmm. I mean, doing more like that, but I think with other affinity groups as well would be incredible. And I, I admittedly am not part of a marginalized community. I don't know if you can tell, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, I value these experiences. I come from a town in South Carolina that's 50% white, 50% black. I'm not saying I completely understand the experience, but I understand, I understand that these people, you know, they feel that differently than I do and they've experienced life differently and that's why I'm trying to make so much strive to put more money into student advocacy office so that people who are in marginalized communities can have a better shot at making sure their experience is equitable. So are, are you saying that I mean I wouldn't be surprised if this is the case but this is the first time that uh, I've heard somebody say it out loud. Are you saying that uh, like the GUPD and, and other uh, disciplinary procedures are um, impact people of color more than than white folks. Is Again, I don't have any personal experience with that, but all I want to do as Gusa president is give people of color the best materials possible, so that they feel that that's what's happening to them. They feel that they're being you know, they feel that they're being a victim of a racist crime or racist treatment, then we need to do everything we can to help them. Even um, even something as small as when you get the GUPD alert and it lists, like, the color of the, of the person yeah, who that, was... Yeah, that's one thing I've noticed. Yeah. But go on. I'm sorry. Yeah, even something like that can contribute to, to marginalization and, and just a subliminal bias of, of students against one another, which is something we're trying to fix. That I think the the whole thing about the complexion, um, I I think is one of the biggest drivers of of implicit bias. So I'm I'm glad that y'all are mindful of that. Um, so so I take it uh, the black community is one that you feel like you're capable of representing well. I wouldn't say well. That? <laughs> that's a that's a bit of a stretch. Well, but what what I'm asking yeah. is what what's what's a community that you feel up to the task of representing well, or that you feel like you've accomplished something for, mm -hmm. uh, and, and then what's one that you'd like to learn more about or do more to help? You know, um, one of my friends who I worked with in the Senate, Dominic Gordon, who's a big supporter of us, we were talking about ways how we could help students with disabilities. And they're with the Academic Resource Center. Maybe with our budget surplus, we could put more money into helping those students. So I would be willing to help with those students as much as possible. One thing I think is particularly interesting is is that Anya, you're an outsider. Yeah. You have never served in Gusa before. Nope. So what what uh, what do you think? And I mean, I could come up with it, but I want to hear your take. What do you think the value in that is? Um, well, like I was saying, I, I would like to not play politics, and I, I'm just here to achieve results um, effectively, which I think, I mean, I know I've been talking to Spencer about this, and a lot of times, guess the resolutions, they won't pass because of the politics, and because people have pledged to vote, and then they don't vote, and it's just such a, such a large problem. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think as an outsider, I can say, like, look, let's forget all of that. Let's just, this is a good resolution, it deserves to pass because it'll help this person and this person and this group, and we should pass it. Um, and, yeah, and Carlton, I've noticed through my experience in Gusa that the best kind of person in Gusa is the new kind of person in Gusa. I'm glad to announce that we're the only ticket that has someone who's completely outside of the bubble of Gusa. So she will bring a very good perspective, and these people bring in new ideas. It's a lot easier to bring in someone with new ideas and help them learn the system than someone who's been in the system and may not have the innovation that we need. So, uh, how would you describe what you're hoping to get done 
and what your relationships with the stakeholders are, like the, the descendants and uh, the administrators that are involved in making decisions about the GU-272? Um, I think that there's a lot of progress being made in identifying um, exactly the impact on these descendants, and um, I think as Augusta we would probably defer to the experts in that field um, to identify um, who is in need of grant money, for example, and things like that. But I think what we can do is, is support them as much as we can, whether that's financially or through fundraising events or just, just by saying the student body backs you. Mm -hmm. um, Nothing but getting the word out there. And we need to make, the first thing we have to do before we do any of this is we need to build trust back through the student body. I've proven that I'm the only candidate to do that because I have the most consistent record, voting record in the Senate. I'm the person who's going to get the transparency back and she's going to help me. So uh, this is, again, so, sort of uh, circling back to an earlier part of our conversation that I found interesting. So. The, the Washingtonian article in which uh, w one current member of the Hilltop Show leadership and, uh, and another uh, former member, our, our former president, Alex Bowman, was, was quoted in that piece. And the conclusion it comes to is the conclusion that I came to the day after the election, which is that... Uh, you know, a lot of Gus elections, we are just rerunning the culture war. We're rerunning 2016 and 2020, these, these controversial elections that we've had nationally in the United States. Mm -hmm. Now, I've picked up hints that you're hoping to take a different approach uh, and to not fight this on culture war issues. Is that right? And, and how, do you, how are you different? Ours, our, sorry, no. our goals are strictly monetary. I have a plan that is going to help defund our budget away from waste. It's going to build better communication with administration. Hopefully we can get more transparency through for the students so that they can have more confidence in us. I don't really care about these social, these like culture war issues, but what I care about is trying to build good communities on campus. And as we're able to have a more responsibly spending GUSA that's going to advocate for students like I have, then we're going to get it done. Yeah. Um, obviously, you know, Georgetown is a microcosm of the world. But as GUSA, we are not fighting the same battles. You know, we're fighting the mundane day-to-day -day battles, mm -hmm. um, without which, um, for example, affinity groups couldn't advocate for themselves. Um, so, you know, we really are just providing a platform for other people to speak on issues. So, um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to meet Olivia, your campaign manager. Um, you know, we're, we're fortunate that y'all are transparent enough to let us know who your campaign <laughs> manager is. Because uh, at, at least two, maybe, maybe all three of the major campaigns last year, uh, did not tell us who their advisors and who their staff are. So... You've told us who Olivia is, and I appreciate that uh, more than more than y'all know. Um, who are some of the other people that are advising you, uh, and who are the people that you expect to draw support from? Who are some of your most prominent supporters? Um, that you, whose um, endorsements you appreciate. Well, Olivia is really the only official campaign staffer we have. I know last year, you know, campaigns had about six staffers. Isn't that crazy? It's a student. It's a student government campaign. Who needs we that have many? a week it to run? Is. We right. have a week to run a campaign. I, I've been on <laughs> campaigns for for city council and county commission that have had smaller staffs uh, than Augusta <laughs> Augusta presidential campaign. Yeah, yeah. Um, Olivia, we're fortunate enough to have her. She works for the Democratic Senate Committee, mm -hmm. campaign committee. So she's more oh, than we have we have something to talk about then because <laughs> I, I work with Democratic Senate campaigns as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we are we, she's more than more than qualified to to help us run our campaign. And to be honest with you, in terms of advisors, um, Spencer has so much knowledge about GUSA and and the functioning of GUSA and I, as someone who's who's a leader of a club and who has been, frankly, been a student here for three years um, and experienced both on and off campus life. Um, I feel that we we are 
we are more than qualified to represent the, the student of Georgetown and we don't really need someone telling us how to play politics or do anything like that. We're just we're just here to to be ourselves and present the true people that we will be even after we get elected. And you know, as president of Prospect Records, she knows that musicians can be very well rounded people sometimes. So she <laughs> she has a lot of good conversations with people who have a very wide variety of different experiences on campus. So she's very good at bringing those issues to the table. I'm currently talking with the ex-Senator Dominic Gordon. We're trying to do our best to help people with disabilities get the resources they need to have a better learning experience. And he's endorsed you, is he's that endorsed, correct? That's right. And in terms of support, um, I'm think, I hope that people who have seen me run a club, who have been a part of one of the clubs which I'm on the board of or run, um, and have seen that I can be a good leader, um, and affect, especially most importantly, an effective leader, mm -hmm. and carry out, plan events, plan plan major concerts effectively, and be on top of everything. Um, I hope that I have their support um, in managing such a large project as GUSA. Campaigns on both sides of the political spectrum mm -hmm. uh, have said that they want to do politically motivated uh, budget cuts. Uh, that they. If, if you're on the wrong side of the abortion issue, they want to cut your club budget. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you're, uh, if you're a Democrat and, the, and somebody who's a Republican gets elected uh, president, then GUCD budget, you can kiss it goodbye. Mm -hmm. uh, and the same if the reverse happens. So are, are, is that in y'all's plan? Are you going to have politically motivated budget cuts? And, and do you really have control over it? Because it's the senators, right, who vote on that stuff. Absolutely not. Yeah. I I am completely opposed to ideological leanings as Augusta Senator because we are, do not work in Capitol Hill. I know a lot of people like to pretend we do, but we don't. All we're here to do is give students that we have on campus, we're here to give them the best opportunities to thrive. And period. Like I said earlier, we've said many times, we're all about transparency and effectiveness and we are not here to play politics and it is not about us. Um, it's not about our administration, it's about making lasting change we can, which can last no matter the political affiliation of, of the administration. So, Well, I, I appreciate that because, you know, given, given your answers, I sort of suspected that uh, you, you wouldn't be making politically motivated budget policy, but at the same time, uh, it's important to get our candidates on the record uh, talking about that. Mm -hmm. Now, y'all may have seen uh, a, uh, a petition that's being circulated by Maria Victoria Almeida, who's running for Gus's Senate from uh, the class of 25. And one of the planks is something that's quite popular, which is uh, to get Guts running on the weekends. Uh, another proposal that's been made in the past is um, to is to electrify the fleet of guts, and looking even longer term, uh, Gusa does have a federal relations team and a, and people that work with the local D.C. government, uh, and those people, I presume, would be working on uh, trying to bring a more convenient connection to the metro and the rest of the city mm -hmm. to our campus. So how do you plan to use those tools and what proposals that have been put forth about transportation do you believe in? So in terms of guts, I think, um, you know, obviously it would be ideal to have guts also running on the weekend, but I think within reason we have to consider, you know, the, the transportation staff and mm -hmm. especially bus drivers and making sure that they are, they are being factored into the equation because it's not all about the students and it's not all about the university. Um, these are people who are coming to our campus and, and, giving, and giving so much to us, so I think it's important to consider them um, in our decision making. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't want to make any bus driver feel uncomfortable for what they're doing. Like, as someone who has to work three days a week in the city, they provide me a great experience without having to blow my entire budget on transportation. So anything that can help these bus drivers and also help the students, we need to listen to both sides on that. So is there is there something that we can do, that, that we can give 
to the bus drivers to to make uh, weekend guts work because I mean you come across as someone who's uh, very much open to dialogue and open to compromise. Mm -hmm. So if there's anybody that could pull this off, if what you say is true, then it, it seems like it would be you, right? So what what are, what do you think we could give to them? I think it's important that we need to make sure that they have someone advocating on their behalf. People who can advocate that bus drivers, if we're going to work on weekends, we need X. X per hour instead of X per hour. You need to do what you can. We need to follow what COVID restrictions that we choose to. We need to make sure those conversations happen. Otherwise, if we get this done, we might have a lot of disgruntled bus drivers, and we don't want that. And in terms of electrifying, um, obviously that's a big um, monetary uh, mm -hmm. monetary um, thing to do. So, I mean, as Gus said, we can we can provide recommendations, and we could we could have a referendum saying this is what the student body wants, mm -hmm. um, and you know suggest that this is where the student body wants their money being being placed. Um, but I, that's kind of all we can do as Gusa. What did, what role did you have, Spencer, as a senator? in um, getting the, the Metro Pass pilot program started? Started? I was not in the Senate when it started. Okay. Yeah. So, new since I've been at Georgetown is uh, candidates have made a habit out of attacking the campus press, including the Hilltop Show. Uh, we were accused of uh, inciting... Uh, racist harassment. The uh, the Hoya and the Voice uh, were attacked for not endorsing certain candidates. Um, and uh, the let's see, what's it called? The People's Republic of the Hilltop Show, <laughs> the outlet that shall not be named, uh, ran its own ticket on. A, uh, on a platform <laughs> of sort of reducing that, that acronym. And what? I, w I wanted to ask y'all uh, what you expect your relationship to the press to be. The, oh. fact of, the fact of the matter is is that we, again, our transparency is what's going to build a good relationship with the press. We have to build a good trust relationship first. Um, this this session, I think I've maybe seen two reporters from the Hoya or the Voice come to our meetings. And I think it's because a lot of senators, whenever they face the tiniest bit of criticism, they like to crowd, they like to defend. And I'm not about that. If, if someone has a legitimate gripe with what I'm doing, I would like to have a conversation with them. I'd like them to be at those meetings. So if they feel like whatever we're doing is not the good idea, I will listen to them. Um... So, so finishing up, what do you feel differentiates y'all from your opponents? And uh, what do you think is a, a good attribute that your opponents bring to the table? Um, for me personally, um, like, like Spencer said earlier, I'm one of the only, I think if not the only, candidate who has not been a part of GUSA in the past. Um, luckily for me, I am grateful to have such a strong uh, presence in GASA, as Spencer has been in the past, to guide me through everything. He's already talked me through a lot of the processes and exactly what goes on, but he hasn't pushed me to have a certain opinion. So I, I bring a, like a fresh take to GASA, um, because I, I've never been to a GASA, a GASA meeting or anything like that. So You've never been to a GASA meeting? <laughs> How about that? Yeah. So, um... There's not much you're missing. <laughs> no, I know. I went, to, I went to one, and it was such a big waste of time that I decided never to go to another one. Did you go to the three-hour meeting? Where it was, I did, yeah. and I was yeah. like, good Lord, if they're all like that, um, I, I don't know how people do it. You know, a lot of people quit over that meeting. Oh, <laughs> I, a I know a couple of them did. Yeah. So, hopefully nobody quits during our administration, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, but something that I think, uh... That other candidates can bring to the table is um, obviously a lot of them have been Augusta and they've seen a lot of a lot of administrations go through, um, so they I guess they know what to do and what not to do. But um, sometimes that's not necessarily a benefit. So mm. what I'll say on that is I originally was not planning on running, but 
What convinced me was when we were in a meeting about two weeks ago, we had a vote on a bill that was to protect the right for freedom of expression and speech for students. Um, I saw two of my opponents running, uh, the Camber, Hara Camber and uh, Alyssa. They decided to abstain from the vote. And I didn't like this because I knew that they had done this because they saw an election was coming up. I can't prove this, but when I was in the meeting, Alyssa changed her vote from yes to abstain because she had a conversation and basically chickened out from her principles and said, oh, this vote is going to harm my political, my political aspirations to be student body vice president. We can't have that. Every, as long as senators are here, like as long as we keep having these old senators, that's pretty much what it's going to turn into. I've seen it happen to a few people. So I'm glad that we have a new ticket. We have someone who's authentic. We have someone who's going to try to do their best for the student body and not themselves. And that's why we're the best campaign ticket out there. Excellent. Excellent. So now uh, I've drafted up this agreement. Uh, and I'd like to read it for the folks at home. Um, it says... And y'all are y'all two are going to sign it, and I'm going to sign it. We, the undersigned, do hereby legally commit to never use any GUSA title on a job application or resume, <laughs> or in pursuit of clout, oh, professional accomplishment, or publicity. Oh, thank you. Y'all have got a great <laughs> campaign manager for the remainder of our lives. We further promise to submit copies of our resumes to Georgetown's top journalistic outlet. The Hilltop Show, once annually until 2021, 2121, or the apocalypse, which will likely come first. Mm -hmm. This document, signed the second day of November 2022 in the District of Columbia, all relevant law, laws apply. Will y'all sign? Yes. Y'all sign? And, and also, will you all commit to not having a wild rally outside of Healy Hall uh, when the votes are being certified? Um, we'll be having a wild rally somewhere else. Yes, Trust me, Carlton. Right. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Thanks uh, for having us, Carlton. Thank you for having us, man. This was incredible. Yeah.